I'm Doug Duncan, the President and CEO of Leadership Greater Washington, and I want to thank you all for being here with us today. I want to start off by uh, thanking um, Accenture for their support of this event. This is our third uh, Future Greater Washington event that we've done, and we've done them all here at Gallup, which we want to thank Gallup. We want to thank Accenture. We want to thank our leadership partners, uh, Leadership Arlington. Lisa from Leadership Arlington is here. Lisa, thank you very much for being here. Uh, plus Leadership Fairfax, Leadership Howard, Leadership Loudon, Leadership Montgomery, Leadership Prince George's, and Leadership Greater Baltimore. So they're all partners with us on this effort. Uh, we're going to have, it's a little early, we're going to have people still coming in uh, through the morning. So uh, anyway, a couple logistics. Um, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag FGW18, FGW18. And the format today is we're going to have about 15 minutes of talking from the, the people that we've got listed on your program, and then about 15 minutes for Q&A. So it's about a 30-minute session for each of the speakers, and we'll, we'll keep it moving. If you have a question during the Q&A, please raise your hand. We'll have somebody come with a microphone uh, for you. And the restrooms are around the corner, sort of straight that way if you need to, need to do that. Uh, at the end of the day, we're going to have an interactive community call to action led by Marty Rogers from Accenture. So we're encouraging you to stick around for that. Please participate in that, and please give us your best thoughts um, and ideas. So it's now, there she is. Are you ready? Are you? It's now my great pleasure to introduce the chair of Leadership Greater Washington, Pinky Mayfield, who's going to welcome you. Pinky, thank you. This morning. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for being here this morning. So, you know, we are so committed to uh, regionalism as, uh, as an organization. And, you know, this is probably one of the most complex regions in the country. And, you know, since, it's, since, this, uh, since this forum was created three years ago, Leadership Greater Washington has been engaged in some of the most critical conversations. And our community has just really thought about bringing together some of the most critical leaders together to really talk about one purpose, and that's really to solve our region's toughest problems. I really want to give a special thank you to Accenture for serving as today's um, presenting sponsor. Please give a round of applause to Accenture. Um, thank you for re being a regional change maker. We so appreciate your commitment to this effort. Thank you also to all of our regional partners and our leadership partners for this collaboration, for being so successful. Arlington County, Fairfax County, Howard County, Loudoun County, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, and Greater Baltimore County. Let's give them a round of applause as well. And finally, thank you to Gallup for hosting us in this amazingly beautiful space. It's really one of the best kept secrets in Washington. Thank you so much this morning for having us here. And you know, the objectives of this year's leadership exchange is really to share you know, cross-regional initiatives focused on economic growth. Um, we are one of the most booming um, economic, uh, economic growth centers in this country and in the region. And so to collaborate with our diverse peers and to discuss how regional leaders in the region can really make an impact, and that's really what we're all here for. At Leadership Greater Washington, we are committed to collaborating with regional partners and bringing together the area's most accomplished influencers and to enrich change in our region. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce John Clifton and uh, the Global Managing Partner at Gallup to welcome us to this space and officially kick off the day. John? Thank you, Pinky. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Gallup. Uh, Pinky, also thank you for those, uh, thank you for those opening remarks. Um, you guys, I just want to give you a little background about this room, but we've been here for about 20 years now, 
And, you know, when you come across in Washington, we know the famous institutions, the Supreme Court, the White House, Congress. We like to, as, as a polling firm, we like to affectionately refer to this room um, as the Supreme Court of Public Opinion. So, so welcome, welcome. Um, I'm going to get into uh, this because you might be wondering why is Gallup here? And the reason that I'm here is because I want to share with you today what the world's thinking. I don't know what it is, but every time leaders come to this building, um, Newt Gingrich actually visited us of all, of all people this week at Gallup. And uh, the one, pe one thing they always ask us is they say, hey Gallup, can you just quickly tell me what people are thinking? And so that's what I'm going to show you. And I'm going to show you it in eight data points uh, from around the world. But before I get to that, I want to ask you a question. Who are the happiest people in the world? Danish. Who is it? Danish. The Danish. The Danes. The Finns. You're right. The Finns. You know where that data comes from? Gallup. <laughs> it comes from Gallup. That's right. So the United Nations has a group that they put together. And they use our data, a data where we just ask people, rate your life on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is the worst possible life and 10 is the best possible life. Where do you stand today? The people on average who rate their lives the highest, which happened to be Finland, which was last year, they say those are the happiest people in the world. And by the way, there's pretty good face validity to the data as well. Because if you look at them and the people who rate their lives the worst are people in the Palestinian territories, people in Haiti, people in Central African Republic. So people have a good fix on how their lives are going. Because again, I think objectively, when we look at Denmark, when we look at Finland, when we look at Sweden, we say, those are pretty good lives. Now, when you consume that information, you probably look at it, whether it's in The Economist, The New York Times, Wall Street Journal, you look at it and you go, well, my grandmother's from Finland, so this makes sense, she's pretty happy. And you consume the information for entertainment and then you turn the page. And then you say, I would never consume that for policy because these are polls on how people feel. And that doesn't really matter in terms of what it is that I'm working on in my leadership capacity. I would caution you against that thinking and here's why. This is the UK. You guys remember any significant events that happened in the UK in the past few years? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, the big event was Brexit. And if we look back to Brexit and we study traditional economic indicators, what do those indicators tell us? Think about unemployment, for example. What was unemployment leading up to Brexit? Does anyone know? It was low. In fact, it dropped below 5% for the first time since the global economic crisis. In fact, GDP per capita looked like this. And in the quarter before Brexit, it grew at 2%. Of course, then Brexit happened. Now, those happiness things that you're familiar with helps give us a barometer on how people felt. So how did they feel in the lead up to Brexit? That 15 point drop that you're looking at is one of the largest drops we've ever seen over a two year period in any country in the history of our tracking. So while everything from an economic perspective, unemployment, GDP per capita, told us think things were okay, how people felt told us a totally different story. Now you might say, well, gee, John, that's the UK. Have you seen it anywhere else? Any significant events that happened here over the past decade? Because here's GDP per capita in the lead up to the Arab Spring. In fact, the Human Development Index showed exactly the same trend. Perfect linear progress. It was the same in Tunisia and in Bahrain. In fact, um, there's the competitiveness, competitiveness Index that's put out by the World Economic Forum. The year before the Arab Spring started in Tunisia, the Competitiveness Index said that they were 11th in terms of gains from year over year. Think about that. Everything that's rational told us that these places were fine. Here's how people felt. Boy, by the way, that drop was mirrored in Tunisia, and also one of the largest drops we've ever seen in the history of our database was in Bahrain. Roughly 44% of people were thriving, 
in our first couple pulses and it collapsed all the way down to 11%. That put Bahrain, Tunisia, and Egypt all on par with the Palestinian territories. Think about that. Here's another one. Again, I'm just kind of going through the most significant events of the past, past eight years. There's money transactions. You can see where the global economic crisis impacted Ukraine in 2008. Here's, of course, the Euromaidan revolution. And here's how people felt. Now, that 10-point drop that you're looking at, you might say, is that significant? Imagine if that 10-point increase was with unemployment. Think about that. Think about it in America if it went from 5 to 15 percent. It would be headlines everywhere. Every presidential candidate would be talking about it in the lead up to the election. But when it comes to how people feel, it goes almost totally unnoticed by leaders. But I'll tell you who it doesn't go unnoticed by, it's by the people that live in these countries. Here's one more. I don't know if you had this one in mind. <laughs> Any, uh, any interesting things that happened here in the past few years? Anything that surprised you? <laughs> well, there's GDP per capita. You can see after the global economic crisis, everybody knows these data. Of course, here's the 2016 presidential election. So how did people feel in the lead up to this? That 9% drop. It's funny, I was, I was actually sitting with Nobel laureate Danny, Danny Kahneman talking to him about margins of error and the size of percent. If you want to, if, if you want to get humbled by someone who's far smarter than, than yourself, try asking really stupid questions in front of him. But I, I was kind of arguing that like a 4% drop in its significance. But he said, do you know how many millions of people that 9% represents in America? Imagine how many people woke up really different in 2016 than they did in 2014. It was a mood that was so palpable we could probably feel it. But you could also quantify it too. Now, you might say, Gallup, how do you collect this information? Um, this is actually what it looks like. So for 100 countries around the world, we do this in about 140, we've done almost 170 to date, we do face-to-face -face interviews. We break every country into what looks like U.S. congressional districts. So the territory is equal in size by population, and then we interview a bunch of people in there. But the bottom line is, is that we establish a methodology so that everyone in the country has an equal chance of being selected. And it looks like this. That's in Costa Rica. This is just a woman that we randomly selected, and we went in and we said, rate your life on a scale of 0 to 10, where 0 is the worst possible life and 10 is the best possible life. We also ask her whether or not she has a job. We ask her what her income looks like on a monthly basis. But we also ask her how she feels. And by the way, the users of this information, huge users of this, are the United Nations and the World Bank. We ask them other questions like, do you have a credit card? Or do you have a bank account? Here's another example. This is in Indonesia. 150,000 people are asked their opinions around the planet every single year through Gallup, just saying, tell us how you feel so that we can report it to, to world leaders. By the way, it's funny because a lot of you might be real curious about our sampling and that kind of thing. I get critiques about this. I'm like, are you sure you're asking this right? Are you sure your method, isn't this, isn't this perception data? It's funny because then I say back to him, do you know how unemployment is measured? You know what they say back to me? They go, I don't know. I find it funny that they, question this, but they don't question data that they use so often. You know how unemployment's collected by the Bureau of Labor Statistics? It's a survey, just like this. But instead of asking whether or not you have a job, we just ask how you feel. This is our, and that's in Madagascar. These are the types of questions that we asked that I had went through. Imagine your life on a scale of zero to 10. And then there's our coverage. But I want to show you four more trends before we wrap up because these are countries that I think we should keep an eye on over the next couple years. Here's one. By the way, I think we see this in The Economist almost every single week, GDP per capita. But a question that you ask is, are people's lives getting better? Because just because you have pure economic growth doesn't always mean that their lives are getting better. Here's the answer. People's lives in China are getting better. 
By the way, a lot of people look at this and how could that be? Well, keep in mind, 21% are thriving. You know what that means about the other 79%? They're not. China has a long way to go. Here's money transactions in Russia. Here's how people feel. Notice this spike right here. Anyone have any idea what that is? Crimea. Sochi Olympics, one of those two. Watch this. If there was something that would concern me if I was Putin, it's that. There's a guy that did an analysis at the London School of Economics based on life satisfaction data using data from elections in about 20 European countries over a 30 year period of time. You know what he said? His words, not mine. He said, I can predict election outcomes based on how people feel. Here's two more. I don't know what it is, but everything I read about El Salvador is just horrible about the country. And, and maybe that's okay. I mean, homicides are really bad there. There's a lot going on that's wrong there. But here's, here's what the uh, experts on the country tell us. When I say experts, I mean the people themselves. And again, I, I, I fall into my own trap because then I start to try to reconcile this with traditional economic indicators like income inequality. So if you look at income inequality, the place has gotten a lot better compared to the rest of the continent. Same with homicides. Homicides have come down over the past two years. Here's the last one. India and China were put on The Economist about 15, 20 years ago, and they said countries were the same size, but they have totally different uh, governments. And they said, which one's going to get better in the next 10 years? Which one would you bet on? The Economist said bet on India. Our data would suggest that they were wrong. India is now among the worst in our entire database. But what I would suggest that makes it worse is not where they are, but it's the momentum. I share these data with you today because one of the challenges that we have is there's been this revolution of behavioral economics. Popular books, now somebody's been given the Nobel Prize for behavioral economics. In fact, presidential appointees, Obama had some people in his cabinet that focused solely on behavioral economics. The challenge is with a lot of leaders, we still focus on what's rational. Money transactions, whether or not somebody has a job. But we don't get to the emotional side, which really accounts for 70% of human behavior. This is what it looks like at a national level when we actually do start to account for that 70% um, of what makes people emotional. So thank you for including me in these conversations. Happy to answer any questions afterward because I know I'm up for time. Um, and thank you. I am giving a bigger overview of the economy. I'm not touching on any feelings. However, they are correlated often. There are bigger <laughs> factors at play as well, although it's hard to have increased, well, there are clearly exceptions, but it's hard to have improving feelings if your economy is shrinking. That's sort of my take on that. And I'm gonna give, start off with this bigger picture overview. And the main takeaway from that is that our economy is changing, it's diversifying. And then I'm gonna pull us forward into 2018 to give us a little bit of a status update on where we are there and then push us forward thinking in the next sort of three, five years what, our, what we're, we should expect in terms of economic growth. So as I mentioned, our economy is in the middle of a shift right now. Well, it may not be in the middle, but it's in, in the process of changing. And the chart on the left shows where we were in 2010 based on our economic makeup and where those dollars came from. The chart on the right shows where we are roughly now, 2017, lagging a little bit. And you can see that in 2010, almost 40% of our economy was tied in one way or another to the federal government. That shouldn't really surprise anyone. Now in 2017, that share has shrunk. So this is as a percentage of all of the economic activity, not necessarily in absolute terms. And it shrunk to about 31%. And it shrunk you know, several different components. They're breaking out, broken out by where those dollars come from. And the, the increase has occurred primarily in the private sector. So the private sector now accounts for a larger percentage of our economy than it did post-recession. And you can see that it is broken out into these two big categories. The yellow slice shows the non-local serving businesses. Those are things that we, in effect, export. We tend to be a service economy, so we're not 
physically shipping things outside, but we are exporting our knowledge, exporting our managerial skills. They tend to be higher wage jobs, higher value jobs. The other piece of the pie that has grown are, is the green green local serving activities. These are things that residents need. They're restaurants, leisure and hospitality, home health um, healthcare services, and that, that is largely tied to population growth and major demographic trends. And I'm gonna walk you through how this shift has happened, starting with the federal piece. The first major part of this shift actually started to happen in 2012 through 2014, and it Really, you can almost separate it into two different pieces. The first is the, the absolute declines that we had in the federal government. The, this is jobs year over year. That first red bar is back in 2012, and those, those decreases continued through 2014 where they really accelerated. 2015 through, through today, the change in the federal government has mostly been flat. So it's changed a little bit. There's a little bit of variation, a little bit of increase in the 2015-16, a little bit of decreases today, but fundamentally, it's a flat line. So you can kind of think about that change from 2010 to 2017 as firstly, we shed federal government activity, and then secondly, federal government activity stabilized, and from that point on, it was more of a private sector story. This shows the federal procurement, uh, it includes everything that the federal government buys in our region and the services that we provide. It peaked in 2010. These are, these are dollars, current dollars. Hit its trough in 2013. Really didn't do very much in the next few years, but in 2017, it picked back up a little bit. And these are primarily professional jobs. Again, the majority of the things we sell to the federal government, we're not, we're not building boats here. So we tend to sell services and, and our ideas. And so that translates into our private sector jobs, how we change and how we grow. And this is a professional and business service jobs that have been separated into the yellow bars are administrative and waste service jobs, they're support service jobs, and the blue bar are the higher value, what we kind of traditionally think of as white collar jobs, they're technical jobs, they're managerial jobs. And going back to the recession, we started to shed these support service jobs. Firms were shedding, cutting as much of the non-essential services in their eyes as they could. They cut them first and they cut them fastest. They actually didn't cut any of their technical workers until the very end. That's, they, they held off on that. And when the economy shifted and the recession was, was over, essentially, they hired a lot of those administrative service workers back because they cut too many of them and they couldn't sustain that growth. So what you can see is there's a, an increase in the administrative service workers right away, followed by an increase in the technical <clears throat> workers. That pattern reverses during the pullback in the federal government and during the sequestration. And that pullback is the result of the decrease in procurement jobs primarily, or procurement dollars primarily. And firms here, they didn't have any more administrative service jobs to cut. So they started to cut the, the core, their core uh, workforce, the workforce that was performing their, their fundamental uh, activities. And that resulted in this large increase in high wage jobs that continued really into 20, 2014 and really didn't reverse until about 2017, we bounced around a little bit, but starting in 2017, you can see that accelerate again. So again, in this chart, you can, 2012 through 2015, it's a federal story. Since then, it's a private sector story. And our region is different. No other region had a shift like this. They, they had a diff different shifts, but their, their story was not nearly as bifurcated as ours was. And what it has done is it's actually shown up in our aggregated statistics and looking at how, how much our economy has grown since the recession. And compared to all of our other major metro areas, we are lagging and we're still lagging 
The majority of this lag, though, was through 2014. That's when we were really struggling. The private sector was, I mean, the federal government was cutting. The private sector wasn't growing fast enough to account for it. In fact, they were lagging as well. And since then, the federal government has more or less stabilized, and the private sector has been able to pick up a little bit. And so what that means is, so in 2012, this shows a, a, the 2017 growth in the economy. In 2012, 13, 14, we were either dead last or 14th on this chart. It wasn't, wasn't pretty. In 2016 and 15, we bounced back into the middle of the pack for a little while. We're still, we're not quite in the middle of the pack as of 2017. And I know this doesn't look great, but it's actually pretty good compared to where we used to be, especially because this is all private sector growth. It's, it, we're not relying on the federal government to do this. And for our economy, that's a little unusual. We're used to being able to rely on the federal government for our growth. 2018 thus far, we've been continuing these trends. The federal government doesn't seem to have, unless there's going to be a, a major policy decision in the future, it isn't really actively changing its composition. There's a little bit of atrophy, but there's nothing huge that has happened thus far. And so what we are seeing is we're more reliant on the private sector growth, and the private sector growth seems to be picking up a little bit. This is a year-over-year -year change in jobs. We now have had four years of actually above average growth. And it doesn't really feel like it. I would be surprised if anyone has, in this room would say that, that, that say 2015 was a good year. <laughs> and that's because the composition of our jobs has been bouncing around a little bit. The early years, we had a lot of low wage restaurant jobs, home health care aid jobs, things that really don't drive an economy forward. In 2015, or 2016 and 17 and 18, what we've been seeing is this increase in higher value jobs. And it's a, this slow shift in composition. So it's not a whole lot. We can't point to any one thing. But what we can look at for 2018 is that professional and business service bar, it's, it's quite large. It's been picking back up. And again, the, the, the sub-sectoral composition of these jobs is improving. It's not being driven by secondary support jobs. It's being driven by these high wage, high value add growth areas. The second two bars on these charts that are, are above average are education and health services and leisure and hospitality. These are those residential serving jobs primarily. Some of them are support, some of them uh, cater to leisure and travel, business travel. But the, for the most part, they are restaurant jobs and home health care jobs because of our population growth. And this has really been the story for the last few years. Federal government still declining, but our private sector job growth is more than, than, than compensated for the decline. And we're starting to see this mo modest gradual increase in these higher value jobs at, that results in a shift. In terms of where we are in our job growth this year to date through September, we're back in the middle of the pack, which is good news. <laughs> May not feel like it, we used to be hanging out at the end of this chart. That's not good. We're back in the middle of the pack. That's not as we're not outperforming anyone. We used to outperform prior to the recession. The middle of the pack is comparatively much better. And we've also been incrementally improving each year. So we've been moving slowly back up into the middle. And it looks like we're going to keep kind of moving up as, as we go forward. What we did back in 2013 was in order to help us identify these private sector jobs a little bit more carefully, we thought about the high value add jobs, high wage jobs that, are govern are, are, that weren't dependent on the federal government. So what was positioned to grow and take over for the federal government as we diversified? And I'm not going to go into what they are here, though the main takeaway is that 2015, it was abysmal growth in these, in these high value add clusters. Nationally, they had pretty good growth. and We lagged pretty significantly. 2016, still not great, but a little bit better. <laughs> and then 2017, we actually outperformed the nation in terms of growth in these high value add sectors that are unique to us. That's a good thing, and it can't really see it when you look at this total aggregated number. And so, 
Even though we're still lagging going back to 2014, what we're seeing is it's a story of incremental repositioning and incremental improvement. Where are we going? This is the leading index that's a Washington-specific leading index. It forecasts the economy about six to eight months out. Good, good growth in 2017. That decreased bar there is December 2016. Uh, sorry, 17. It's when we had the round of shutdowns, sort of all the shutdown scares, and that affects consumer confidence. We also had a really cold winter, so that was a blip, and then it went back to increasing. And recently, we started to get a little bit wobbly. So, what the way to interpret this chart though is that we are projected to still have growth in 2019. And then after that, that growth might tick down. It'll still be positive. It's just looking a little less certain. And what that means in terms of job growth, though, is that 2019 is projected to be a pretty good year for us. That's a good mix of jobs as well, too. So these aren't all restaurant jobs. There are lots of professional business service jobs. 2020, I'm going to step back a little bit. That 2020 number also includes a census bump. They hire lots and lots of field workers who all get counted in our job space. So some of those jobs aren't as high quality. Then we're going to tick back down just a little bit. Again, we're going to keep a really solid mix of jobs, though. So even though this number isn't large, it's high quality. And that rolls into our overall economic forecast. So this represents the total economic growth of our economy. We've been lagging the US. Going forward, we're projected to more or less increase at the same rate as the US. It's not really great compared to, I don't, this chart doesn't go quite as far back, but it's not great compared to where we were in the early 2000s, but it's much better than this huge lag that we've been having. And with that, I'm up. We are going to continue this transition. The federal government is no longer projected to have these decreases, and instead, all of the shift is going to be because the other areas are increasing in absolute terms. That's reducing the share. And we are so. Ultimately, we should be through the worst of the turmoil from earlier this decade. And we should, again, continue to have this private sector growth that makes our economy more diversified and a little bit more robust going into the future. And with that, I am going to thank everyone. I don't know if we have time for questions. Oh, we do. OK. Yes. Is, oh, I can stop yelling now. There you go. Thank you. Please, wanna, please stand, say your name, and who you're with. Eric. Thank you, thank you Doug. I'm sorry. I'm Eric Silden, and I work at Accenture. Um, if, can you go back to the last slide that you have? So I want to make sure my premise is correct before I ask this question. Wasn't it true that in 2008, this area's economy was not as negatively impacted as much of the country during the recession? So. So with that in mind, both this slide and you also talked about how this area was uh, lagging um, behind in some of our growth. It seems like, first of all, if you were at 2010 and that was 100 on your chart, that maybe we didn't grow as much as others because we hadn't fallen as much as others. And then, so if that's correct too, then I want to actually ask about these two charts here. It seems to me like then the projection for the future is a risk to this area that the next time there is a recession because our impact of total federal government isn't 40 percent it's only going to be 27 percent that the that the next recession could hit this area harder that those local serving activities which are a much larger percentage will be hurt more what do we do to try to get in front of the next recession to not be impacted like the dallas's and atlanta's and other places that saw a big drop in 2008. Right. So moving to this chart, you are absolutely correct. Our economy did not decline during the recession. The recession is 2009. We grew about 3 tenths of a point. The flip side, though, is that when the, the federal government repositioned and started to decrease, we had an 8 tenths of a point decrease. And so that is what th we need to actually worry a little bit more about smoothing out that pattern instead of smoothing out any recessionary patterns. So it is 
The reason that we tend to be a little bit more recession-proof is just in terms of fiscal and economic policy. When a recession hits, the federal government typically will ramp up. And unless there is a, a policy-level decision to change that reaction, we will still be somewhat more recession-proof than your Dallas is in Atlanta. And it's less because we, we uh, have a really large share of the federal government, but more because of how it responds rather than, than any other single factor. And so it's very likely that even if we had a smaller share of the, or now that we have a smaller share of the federal government, it will still react the same way who knows? We can take bets during the next recession if we'll have a stimulus or, if, or how they'll react. But we will still be somewhat more insulated because of that. And having a larger share of these private sector activities will help smooth out this decrease that's, that's almost guaranteed to happen as the government pulls back down after a stimulus. Uh, good morning, Mahan Tavakoli. And uh, we are one region. I'm glad to see the data. A couple of slides back, it seemed that there is uh, much more robust growth in Northern Virginia, and DC and Maryland are lagging way behind. Would love to know thoughts about that and moving into the future. I don't think I have any subsector charts in this one. I think you were at the last, last presentation. I do, each of these sub-state areas has a different composition in what it does. And right now, in 2017 and 2018, suburban Maryland is lagging a little bit. The data are too old, or the data aren't current enough to really pull apart why suburban Maryland is lagging. There might be a few different factors at play there. And it might actually have to do with a shift in the types of a procurement so Maryland is really heavy in the, the health and um, social, social care. That's what the federal government tends to buy from them. And they may not be buying quite as much. And so instead, they might be looking to Northern Virginia, which is DOD based. DC is performing more or less how it, on average, it, it it's, hasn't really had any big swings in the past few years. Hi, Gene Sachs with Cressa, class of 98. Um, been a lot of speculation about uh, an announcement that Amazon is going to make uh, before the end of the year. Have you guys looked at what the impact is going to be in the Washington region? Should they select Northern Virginia or some other pl local place? The one thing I can kind of talk about is that if Amazon shows up by 2022, what this chart will look like, this is a composition, not an absolute, right? It's about two-tenths of a percentage point different in terms of the share. We add about a tenth of a percentage point to local serving activities because Amazon has workers and residents that need stuff. And then about a tenth of a percentage point to non-local serving activities. And so while that is uh, a shift, it's, it's, we've had larger shifts than that in uh, over a year-over-year -year basis because of uh, just natural growth. And so in thinking in terms about what it will do to our overall economy, that's how it'll change, change that a little bit. Yes. How you doing? Um, Marty Rogers with Accenture. Um, you talked about the local serving businesses, but the, the biggest growth proportionally here is the non-local serving businesses. And what do you attribute that growth to, and is it correct to presume that those are the higher paying jobs? Yes. Move back to slides. These are primarily, we designed this to be non-local serving jobs. So it's advocacy services, biotech, media, and uh, four others that, <laughs> that aren't as interesting, uh, information and security, technology, business services. So those are designed to be export-based. What, what, what are we missing? <laughs> So, so these are designed to be export-based, and the, the increase in that share is, is because we, we are actually ticking up in terms of our growth on, the, on that front. They are higher wage jobs on average compared to the rest of jobs. Okay, let's have a nice round of applause for Jeanette. Thank you very much. We really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Just leave it. Uh, next up is Jack McDougall, the President and CEO of the Greater Washington Board of Trade. He's going to talk about the Smart Region Movement. Jack? 
All right, good morning, everyone, and thank you. Uh, and it's really nice, actually, to follow Jeanette, because she can cover a lot of detail that I don't have to get into. Uh, so that's really nice to set the premise for that. But I wanted to share just a couple of observations about some seismic changes that are going on in our world and how that's going to affect us. Our population today, globally, is about 7.6 billion. Uh, by 2040, it's going to be over 9 billion. And by 2050, they estimate it's going to be 10 billion. 10 billion people. That's extraordinary. And what does that mean? A lot of things. Currently, 55% of the global population lives in urban centers. By 2040, we expect roughly 70%. And so that's us here. The uh, Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments estimates that we're going to add about 1.5 million people to our population here over the next 20 years. So these are significant changes that are taking place that we really do need to pay attention to. What does that mean in other areas? Food, for example. It's likely we will have to produce two or three times the amount of food over the next 40 years that we're producing now. And how are we going to do that? That's a massive challenge and problem for us. How are we going to deal with resource consumption and resource use? There are some projections out there that if we continue to use our current resources at the pace we are now, we're going to need to come up with a second planet. That's not very likely. In spite of what Jeff Bezos wants to do in space, I'm not sure he can accomplish this. Um, but <laughs> we do wish him well. Um, when you think about the speed of change and rapid change, you guys all know where this is? Yeah, Shanghai. OK, Shanghai in uh, 1986, 26 years later, OK, that's pretty dramatic. That's fast. So when you look around at all the sky cranes around our area, we're not growing anywhere close to this. You know, so the global competitive landscape out there, it's really different. And it's moving faster and faster and faster. So I just, I, I think that's always, that's just pretty, that's remarkable when you go back and you look over a 26 year period. We could spend a whole other time talking about China and different things going on there with policy and other things, but uh, we'll leave that for another discussion. But nonetheless, we need to pay attention to these kinds of things. One of the things that's really interesting when you think about it is the rapid speed and the, and the growth of the adoption of new technologies. For the telephone to reach 50 million people took 75 years. Radio, 38 years. Television, 13 years. The internet, four years. And don't forget, the internet only came out in 1991, so that's pretty recent. The iPod, three years. And Angry Birds took 35 days for 50 million people to download. That's pretty remarkable. So what happens with all of this technology? Today, there are more lines of code in a John Deere tractor than there was in an Apollo rocket that puts someone on the moon. That's pretty impressive. <clears throat> on the left, anybody know what that is? That's one of IBM's first hard drives with 2,000 pounds, one ton, and it had about 3.5 megabytes of data storage. Today, you can hold a terabyte in your hand and throw it in your camera. When the Mirror supercomputer was introduced in 2013, it could do 10 quadrillion calculations per second. So I'll leave that to all the mathematicians in the room to figure that out. But that's pretty fast. That's a lot of calculations. Today, 200 quadrillion calculations per second. And this is really critical when we start to get into some of the components of artificial intelligence and other things that are going to come online that are going to affect uh, our economic growth patterns in the future. And so these are important things to take note of. So a lot of things are happening. A lot of disruptive technologies out there are going to really stipulate how we're going to grow and how we're going to create jobs, what those jobs need to look like, and how are we going to train, and how are we going to adapt to these new uh, environments. You know, artificial intelligence is talked about all the time. Autonomous systems, everything from cars, drones, to surgeries. Machine learning, collaborative innovation, we're already starting to see some of, the, uh, some of these technologies emerging. Anything to do with genomics and DNA mapping. Bio, nano, and chemistry is transforming the whole host of different types of uh, industries from healthcare to material sciences. Additive manufacturing versus subtractive manufacturing. Uh, the sharing and gig economy, which uh, Jeanette has talked a little bit about that in other presentations I know, and it affects about 15% of our workforce here in the DC area. Lifelong learning and training, everything that we know and think about education and career development and skill development, needs to, we need to figure out new paths, uh, how that's going to take place in the future. And so most of our current models will be upended. Uh, x and supercomputing is just pointed out. The post app and mobile world, 5G, as 5G is rolled out. If you think about Uber and Lyft, most people here use Uber and Lyft. Uber and Lyft couldn't exist in a 3G environment. It wasn't until 4G was implemented. So when you think about what 5G is going to enable us to do, 
It's gonna really change everything that we do from a business perspective. Advanced materials and composites, particularly again at the nano scale, using carbon composite materials is gonna change a lot of things around engineering, building, design, structures, and advanced robotics and sensing. And so against this whole backdrop, the Board of Trade was taking a look at these different issues and smart cities and smart city strategies and technologies are really now starting to take hold across the world. And a lot of cities are adopting these technologies to address a whole variety of different challenges and problems they're facing. And so it's one thing that we wanted to really start to take a look at. Basically, smart cities are deploying new technologies and data collection to make better decisions and create new opportunities. So that's sort of the generic definition of what it is and what it looks like. Some of the early results are actually pretty impressive. If you look at a variety of cities everywhere from Pittsburgh to Copenhagen to Rio to uh, Dallas, Boston, New York, and others, 40% fewer crimes, 15% lower disease burdens, 30% reduced traffic congestion. That's something that we probably want to pay attention to here. Um, emergency response, reductions in emissions. So there's a whole host of things that are emerging that shows how these various technologies can really improve quality of life in our region. In 2006, there were 2 billion devices, estimated in 2020 to be 200 billion. So again, the rate of growth over time. Smart city technology is estimated to go to 1.2 trillion in 2022. So these are areas that we really do want to pay attention to. And we need to keep pace. And there's things that we are doing here in our region. Uh, Washington, Smarter Washington has a pretty significant initiative and other areas do as well. But it's time to start pulling all of those together and thinking about what we can do at scale in this region to address some of these challenges and problems. Um, you know, Jeanette talked a little bit about the economy from 2011 to 2016 out of the top 100 metropolitan areas. We ranked 76th for overall economic growth, 91st in prosperity, 94th in conclusion. So we want to kind of move along uh, and improve those numbers. And as Jeanette pointed out, uh, we are starting to make some progress around that. I won't get into this. She already covered this. But again, a reliance on business services and how do we diversify the economic portfolio becomes much more important for us. But you all know it. Some of our challenges, traffic congestion, public transportation, housing, uh, and something you don't hear a lot about, but something that we do, do want to start talking about is electrification and the grid. And we really need to modernize our grid or a whole host of these other issues aren't really going to matter. You know, we have a really educated workforce, but we don't have all the workers we need. So we have to pay attention. Where are the gaps? How do we fill those gaps? You know, we're doing pretty well in bio, we're doing pretty well in cybersecurity, but in and of itself, that's likely not enough to diversify our portfolio. When you think about all the other technologies and disruptions that are taking place, we need to be in the lead for uh, health tech, artificial intelligence, and other areas uh, where we actually do have some opportunities. You know, we have a real uh, a concentration here of nonprofit organizations, and that's a strength that we can really leverage much more effectively. And we also, you know, uh, we, we talk about the federal government, but the federal government offers us a lot of opportunities here that I don't think we've yet fully leveraged. And so there are things, for example, NIH. NIH plays a massive role in why we've become such an important biotech region in the country. And so there's ways that we can leverage those resources, particularly at the R&D level, much more effectively. And also, we're the center of a lot of global attention. So we've put together a group of companies and organizations across the region to start looking at uh, what would it be for us to become a smart region. So we're at the very, very early stages of this. And so a lot of this is still exploratory. It's still a lot of conversations, still pulling a lot of people together, still building out partnerships with LGW and the Greater Washington Partnership, the Council of Governments and others, so that we can really start to collaborate and think about what is the longer term trajectory that we want to follow over the next 5, 10, 15, and 20 years. Because what we do today needs to play out over a much longer time frame. And so we're looking at this very holistically across a whole host of different areas in a much more integrated system. So it's not that the Board of Trade is going to lead in all of these things, because there's other organizations around our region that can take the lead here. And so how do we work together to ensure that we're all more successful collectively than if we all try to continue to go at some of these issues uh, independently? And all of these different things uh, will be impacted by where we're going. And so our basic premise here is how do you use technology and innovation to really drive inclusive economic growth and livability over the long term? And so that's what we're really focused on. 
And so a few things that we are particularly looking at right now, and in fact, I've got something right after this around grid modernization, but we have to look at that. It's a huge vulnerability for us. And so if we want to move towards more electrification, there are things we have to do around the grid. We're very interested in broad uh, connectivity and ensuring that we have seamless connectivity across all of our different jurisdictions and regions uh, so that no one is left behind and that we close any remaining digital divide out there. We've got a project right now that we're working on with the Department of Defense around looking at an integrated uh, technology platform to improve healthcare services that involves autonomous systems as well as artificial intelligence. Uh, we're also looking at some man, uh, manufacturing issues here. One of the most significant things I think that's happened in our region lately was attracting Micron out to Manassas and putting in a $3 billion chip fab. So we can make things here, and that adds much more economic value to the portfolio, and it augments and complements a lot of the things that we do around consulting and business services. Food and economic security, you know, it's not something that we always think about here in this region, uh, but 800,000 people in our region still need some kind of food assistance. A lot of kids in our region aren't getting enough uh, vegetables and uh, nutritious uh, foodstuffs uh, to the extent that they should be. And so we're trying to look at things and how can we increase the supply of those things across our region and how can we address things in food deserts in order to become a smarter region. One project that we're looking at right now is co-locating uh, hydroponic vertical farms with data centers so that we can reduce energy density. So for example, data centers produce a lot of uh, heat and hydroponic farms need a lot of heat. So how could we use our resources more effectively? So those are the kinds of business models that we think are necessary over the next 10, 15, and 20 years that are really gonna put this region out in front from a global competitiveness perspective, as well as create jobs, interest, attract investment, and attract uh, workers uh, to our area and allow us to address a lot of the other issues and problems that we have. Um, and then smarter skills. It's not just about the high tech skills. It's also welders, HVAC, it's hospitality, it's healthcare workers. So we have to have a much more integrated look at what are the needs. Right now, anybody here in the construction business knows, you're pulling in a lot of your workers from other parts of the country and that's putting your costs way up because you have to pay for that labor because we don't have it locally. And so thinking about that in a much more integrated and systemic fashion becomes much more important. So just in summary, we are at the very, very early stages of this and beginning to have some initial conversations, bringing people together to think about what are the long-term prospects here if we really do begin to leverage some of the technology and innovation <coughs> advancements that we have going on out there. And how can we really push for more inclusive economic growth across our region that we become a national and global model, uh, as well as improve our overall livability. Okay, and so with that, um, I know I went through a whole bunch of slides. They were concerned I wouldn't do it in 15 minutes. So I probably did a few things really quickly. I'm happy to talk about any of that uh, now or uh, later. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. So when you think of DC, we think of a very traditional city. Just look at the monuments and the architecture, um, kind of an old school city. How are you going to overcome public sentiment to really change the way that our region is thought about for this smart growth? I love it. I'm excited about it. Um, but I think there's some, some mental shifts that need to happen to get there. Angry birds, 35 days. You know, So we're already seeing that. We're already seeing those types of trends. Some of the things that Jeanette talked about here uh, this morning about how we're starting to see more important uh, contributions of the private sector here is you see you know Micron making a significant investment here um, you know if you all know Jonathan Aberman you know he talks about we have roughly a thousand cyber uh, consulting firms in this region only 10% produce product but yeah we have all this intellectual capital in the other 90% so if we start to unleash that intellectual capital to begin making things then we're going to start to be on that trajectory. But this is long term. It's not going to happen overnight. You know, a lot of it's going to be conversations like this. It's getting people involved and it's going to involve mistakes. You know, we're going to go down pathways that might not make sense at some point in time. And so we stop and we move to something else. So we have to really increase our tolerance for innovation and our tolerance for risk taking. You know, part of the conversation earlier, and I think Eric might have stepped out, but when you think about being recession proof or whatnot, um, the, the cycles affect this region a little bit differently, but the fact that we do have a component of our economy that is reliant on government services affords us an opportunity to take more risk, actually, when you think about it over the longer term. And so if we can leverage that more effectively, 
I have no illusions that this will be uh, easy, uh, but I really think for our long-term viability, it's critical. And so it's gonna take all of us working together, uh, and it's gonna take a lot of conversations and a lot of public awareness building, so you're right on about that. Uh, Peter Rosenstein. Um, you had a chart there with all the different businesses that were involved that you're connecting, and I didn't see it large enough, but uh, long enough. Have you involved the seven or eight major universities that are in our area and the 80,000 students that are here every year, um, which is pretty amazing in a, lot of, in a lot of ways? Are they fully involved in looking at these proposals and looking at how we can move forward? Yes. Uh, the short answer to that is yes, and when I talked about putting in hydroponic facilities, uh, we're actually pulling together a group of faculty advisors and graduate students to help us build out that model a little bit, and we can start to look at what are some of the commercial applications so we can then bring in some companies, as well as potential investors in that. Uh, another area that they're looking at specifically with us, and this ranges from George Washington to George Mason, Virginia Tech, Maryland, uh, as well as community colleges. So it's meant to be all inclusive. So uh, anyone that wants to participate, let us know. Uh, you know so we don't want to exclude uh, anyone, uh, you know, University of DC, others. Uh, and then the other group, the other project that they're looking at right now is around what does the landscape here really look like for product? How do we begin to move towards more of a product-based economy? And I'm not talking that we're going to have 40 or 50 percent of our portfolio around that, but how do we expand out? How do we begin to grow our product exports a little bit? Because we know the value of that to the economy, and I know we, we, we've talked quite a bit about that as well. And so there's a lot of interest in looking at it from that perspective. Um, but the universities are actually helping to uh, develop some RFPs with us that would attract some more manufacturing type investment. Uh, to this region. And, you know, and manufacturing today, it's not about rolled steel, it's about a kid you know, in a polo shirt and iPad running you know, five CNC machines in a clean room. You know? and, so, and you can do that in a small footprint and create really high value ac economic activity. And so it, it's a shift in how we balance out that portfolio, but abs absolutely, and uh, we need to keep pushing more on that. Yeah. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Mady Henson. I'm with Covenant House Greater Washington, class of 2010. Uh, I'm, it's about the same chart that you had up there, the think tank chart, which I think is exciting. But as you said earlier, a big strength of this region are the nonprofits. Uh, it is a big part of what makes this a very rich region. So I saw a really gap and lack of them on that chart as I was quickly scanning. So I, and yet we are directly addressing many of those issues that are challenging, whether that be food insecurity, housing insecurity, et cetera. How is that voice of the nonprofit sector to any great degree being put into that mix? Um, to a great extent, actually, uh, Rosie, who's here with us today, is actually uh, with the Board of Trade uh, and the United Way. Uh, she's leading those efforts for us. And one of the things that was most interesting when we started first talking about this initiative, the uh, number of nonprofit and socially oriented organizations that reached out that wanted to play a role was very impressive. So, uh, I mean, across a whole spectrum from, uh, you know, food and disadvantaged communities, uh, from early childhood, AARP, a number of them. And so they will have a very strong and active voice. You know, as I said, we're getting started. We, we called this deliberately a smart region movement. And if you look at the dictionary definition of movement, it's a group of people getting together to get something done. And so we want to pull in more and more people as we go forward. Um, right now, I probably can't add any more logos to that charge because I've run out of room. So I'm going to have to figure out how to do that as we move forward. You know, and I, I'd love it to get to the point where we have 57 slides like that of just logos of everybody who's engaged in this and everybody who's participating in it. So yes, absolutely. Uh, they will play a really big role in this. Yeah, Chase. Oh. Hi, Jill Klein. I'm from American University. And um, my question is related to a slide that was way back there where you had that were in the 95th percentile on this. Can you go back to that one? It has some numbers on there that I'd like some context for um, because it talks about how we don't come up very high on things like inclusivity. And so I'm curious as we talk about this smart region, keep going, it was way back there. So I couldn't decide if I wanted to, if it was meant well, to I get, get us yeah, upset. But the question becomes, as we look at these smart region um, initiatives, 
what is the impact to those numbers and what's the importance of those numbers? Because when I see DC sitting in the 90s, I am like, whoa, I think we're better than that. So help me understand how to understand those numbers and how does this improve those numbers? So those numbers are amalgamations. So they take into account, so economic inclusivity, for example, looks at everything from poverty rates to employment in particular uh, jurisdictions across the region. Um, it looks at labor uh, participation rates, and so there's a whole host of different ones. We can talk about that in more, more detail uh, if you'd like after. Uh, and so what it looks at, and so those are rankings that are produced by Brookings Metropolitan Studies Group, uh, and they do them, and so I think we're due for an update on those pretty soon, so we'll be able to see if things have changed significantly between 2016 and now. Uh, but it's based on the top 100 metropolitan regions across the country. But we've known in this region for a long time that there's been some issues around economic, uh, the economic divide and how do we create a more inclusive economic portfolio. And so if you think about what smart technologies do, particularly around internet co connectivity in particular, is that it allows everybody to have equal access. And so when you begin to level the playing field, that affords more people to take advantage of what opportunities are being presented out there and do so at a lower cost than they might otherwise be available to them. So it's a long-term play. It's not gonna happen overnight, uh, but it definitely is a long-term play. Yeah, Bob. Hi, I'm Bob McCartney from the Washington Post. I have two questions. First, you mentioned that some other cities, you mentioned uh, Pittsburgh and Dallas, uh, have made progress on smart city stuff. Can you talk a little bit about what they did to, uh, to make that progress? And the second question is, can you talk a little bit more about modernizing the electrical grid and why that's so important and what would have to happen for that to be achieved? Sure, so on the first point, so Pittsburgh, so think about Pittsburgh, it's a steel town and the bottom fell out on steel. Uh, so they didn't have a lot going on over there from an economic perspective. So the business community actually got together and took a leading role in figuring out how to implement disruptive technology. So they are actually now a leader around uh, artificial intelligence technologies and other things. But one thing they did is they did, uh, from a smart city application, is they did traffic light synchronization. They reduced traffic congestion by 30%. You know, so again, th these are still early indicators, but if you think if we were able to synchronize lights across our region, and you can't just do it in DC, it has to be done across the region, if you could alleviate 30% of traffic congestion, that would be fairly significant. We would notice that. Uh, so, so that was what, uh, uh, yeah, we would notice that, right? Um, you know, so when we start thinking about, and I know, uh, 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 Jennifer's going to talk a little bit more about mobility in the region and things like that, and we've been talking very closely with them about thinking about what are some of these different approaches that we can use uh, as we think about the longer term. Because you know, if you think about just mobility on its own, you know, upgrading some of our current transportation systems, whether it's an outer beltway or a second bridge, I mean, we're talking 10, 20, even 30 year investments. We can't wait that long. You know, we need to do some things now, and so what does that longer term plan look like? Um, Dallas, in particular, uh, just wanted to get out in front of it, and so they're putting in a whole host of different types of, of technologies. Oakland's another interesting case where they've put in technologies uh, to monitor uh, gunshots, and as a result of that, response times have increased significantly to the point where their crime rates in some neighborhoods have dropped as much as 70% just because the police can respond more quickly. And what that's done, and that gets, Katie, to your point too about public awareness, that's helped people to begin to understand how these technologies can impact their day-to-day -day lives and why that's really important. Uh, and so as you start to see more and more of these examples, it's beginning to catch on uh, as well. And then the second question was around the grid. Electric, yes, and what what, why is that so important and what needs to happen so the grid's pretty vulnerable because it hasn't been upgraded in years and years and years. And so, for example, if we want to start deploying more solar panels, we don't have two-way transmission capacity to the extent that we would need. So when you think about bringing alternatives into the grid, also when you think about the pipelines coming into DC in particular, uh, if any one of those goes down, we're looking at outages that could go on for potentially weeks. You know, And so that would undermine a lot of our economic activity. and. Uh, how people would respond to that. And so if we think about electrification, we think about electric cars, we think about more data centers, we think about additional technologies, most all of these things are driven by electricity. And so we, got, we need to really make sure, so we have to rebuild a lot of our substations so that they can handle bigger loads. 
Uh, we need to look at other risks and vulnerabilities. We need to make sure that we're protected against cyber attack and bringing the grid down uh, and all of those different elements. And so that's something that we think we should talk a lot more about and uh, really need to pay attention to. I know right now there are proposals in front of the Utilities Commission uh, to begin making some of those kind of investments. And so we really need to, to take a look at that. Does the initiative need to come from Dominion and Exelon, or does it need to come from the public side? What, 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 who needs to take the lead there? I think it's a combination. The utilities, so the utility companies are the ones that will actually do the work. But I think the business community getting together, much as we did around Metro and other things, to alert public officials and others how critical this is, how important it is, and begin to uh, help them understand why this needs to be done, and then figure out what are those longer-term funding mechanisms so that we can get started on it now. Yeah. Jack, thank you very much. Yeah. All right, thank you, thank so you much. everyone. Next, we have Jeanette Chapman from the Greater Washington Partnership. He's going to talk to us about talk to us about workforce development and regional mobility. Thank Jennifer, thank you, you very much. That's okay. Okay. Terrific. So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jenny Kaplan, and I serve as the Vice President for Engagement and External Affairs at the Greater Washington Partnership. It is a pleasure to be with all of you, although I got the dangerous slot before your break, so I'll try really hard to keep everybody awake today. Uh, I want to thank Leadership Greater Washington for uh, inviting me to be here, and I also want to recognize Sandy Hallmark, who serves on your board and is also, we're fortunate at the partnership to have her serving as our chief legal officer, so thank you to Sandy for all the millions of phone calls of ours that she answers every day. Um, I am a big fan of Leadership Greater Washington. I think that your mission is incredibly important. I'm also a leadership development nerd. Uh, my prior role at the end of the Obama administration, I served as the director of the White House Fellows Program. Uh, I think it's an incredibly important thing for people to do and to invest in, and so I commend you for, for doing that. At the end of the administration, I thought long and hard about what I wanted to do next, uh, and I knew that two things were true. One, uh, I have what my mother lovingly calls my save the world gene, uh, and I wanted to do something to continue to have an impact on people's lives. Uh, second, I wanted to do something that was local, that focused here uh, in a place that I have called home for uh, nearly 17 years. So uh, enter the partnership. In December of 2016, the partnership was created uh, with no staff, really. Uh, and the more I learned about what they were doing, the more interested I was. Uh, the partnership broadly defines the region from Baltimore to Richmond. Uh, we have a serious focus on the region's economy, which as you've heard multiple times today is slow growth. Uh, we are, however, the third largest economy in the country and the seventh largest in the world when you define it from Baltimore to Richmond. Um, the partnership is passionate about changing the trajectory of the region and focused on solutions uh, to the hardest problems that we, that we face. I've always been interested in the question of what's business's role in trying to do good and have an impact. Uh, the partnership represents 22 of the region's largest employers from Under Armour in Baltimore down through Dominion Energy in Richmond and Monumental Sports here in Washington uh, and many others. We seek to be a consistent voice at the table with government and academia and nonprofits and others uh, driving the region's economy forward. Uh, importantly for me, we are focused on unity, uh, committed to equity, and um, really focused on bringing the region together to drive, uh, to drive results. We're happy with the progress we have seen to date, but know that there is still uh, more work to do. So that's great. Sign me up. Uh, what does that actually mean on a day-to-day -day basis? So at the beginning, uh, it meant working in a very small office at a WeWork with no stapler. Um, but eventually, it meant that uh, I now envision a region where three times the number of people can travel by commuter rail, um, where people of all backgrounds have equitable access to jobs and healthcare and essential services, um, where our educational institutions and employers are seamlessly connected so that they can leverage each other's expertise, unlock innovation, and equip our workforce with the cutting edge skills uh, of the future. It also means a region where companies stay here and keep jobs here because our workforce is so dynamic. 
And others want to come here because they see unity at the highest levels and realize that if you come here, you actually get three jurisdictions uh, in one. The partnership has decided to take on two major initiatives to, uh, to try to realize this vision. The first is around improving regional mobility, and the second is around uh, improving the skills and developing the, the workforce we need now and in the future. In our region, 50% of people travel across a county line and 20% travel across a state line every day uh, to go to work. Multi-jurisdictional collaboration is critical if we're gonna do anything to transform our region's transportation system. Uh, in November of this year, uh, we are going to be releasing our regional mobility blueprint. Uh, the blueprint is a first ever uh, employer-led end-to-end transportation agenda uh, for the region. It is led by three of our, our co-chairs. We have uh, Tom Farrell of Dominion Energy in, in Richmond, Mark Weinberger of EY, and Ken Samet at MedStar Health. Uh, it was developed in conjunction with hundreds of stakeholders around the region. Uh, it is action-oriented and forward-looking and not intended to sit on the shelf. Uh, the blueprint contains seven solution areas and corresponding actions that policymakers and private employers and government officials can take today to start to improve and change the trajectory of our region's transportation system. Uh, the blueprint is based around four core uh, principles or areas. Uh, the first is connecting the super region. The second is improving the consumer experience. Uh, the third is ensuring equitable access. And the fourth is integrating innovation. How many of you use Lyft, Uber, scooters, which sort of scare me a little bit, uh, the bike apps, all of those? How nice would it be if those were in one place, if you could go to one application and pay for public and private transit in one place. Um, why is that important? Uh, because if you're a type A like I am and you want to be as maximally efficient as you can, it would be great to be able to go and understand the optimal way to get to where you're going. In the absence of that, it strains the system and creates congestion. Uh, and so part of what the blueprint is proposing, just one of the many solutions in there, which we rolled out in July, is a seamless one-stop shop and platform for uh, being able to do these things in a coordinated way. So from higher speed rail to reimagining the bus uh, to many other things, there are a lot of exciting parts of the blueprint, but I think the most important thing to leave you with is that this is not the partnership's blueprint. It was developed with stakeholders and experts across the region and is the region's blueprint. Uh, and we hope that it will provide a path forward uh, for people to make decisions and be able to prioritize and actually make some changes to improve uh, the transportation system for everyone. So our second uh, major initiative is around uh, both uh, equipping and preparing our workforce and attracting and retaining top talent. Um, this region has immense education and innovation assets. We have a number of globally renowned universities. We have 115 federal labs and federally funded research centers. Universities and laboratories in this region in 2016 alone expended $5.3 billion in research and development. That is actually more than places like the Bay Area and Boston that are considered like hotbeds of, of innovation. In December of last year, the partnership released a report that analyzed our region's workforce, in particular our tech workforce. And we are the third largest producer, I mean, sorry, we are the largest producer of tech qualified graduates in the country. Uh, so what's the problem? We're such a tech hub that we have thousands of unfilled jobs, largely because we're exporting that talent. Over the last five years, 54,000 people who were trained in, with these skills have left the region. So in April of this year, the partnership launched uh, the Capital Collab, which is a collaborative of leaders in academia and business, stretching from Johns Hopkins to Virginia Tech. Uh, they've come together to take multi-business, multi-university action 
to try to position the region as an innovative hub. The first two areas that the collab is, is addressing is the creation of a region-wide digital credential and hosting a, a tech showcase. Uh, led by Wes Bush at Northrop Grumman, the collab uh, entities have come together to create both a generalist credential and a specialist credential that are designed to equip our workforce with cutting edge technologies, as Jack mentioned, that are needed in data analytics, AI, machine learning, and others. And we are excited that AU and George Mason are gonna be launching with their students in January. Uh, in addition, the partnership is starting to roll out uh, our, some other work in our workforce space. We're going to be producing a labor market information. We have heard from policymakers and educators how important it is to actually have a good sense of what employers are looking for and what they need in their workforce. We are um, enthusiastic about using this to uh, provide it to school systems and work with folks to create career pathways for those from high school on up to high value jobs in tech and other fields. And uh, hot off the presses, I have uh, more information that was so new we didn't even have time to put it in our fancy slide. Uh, so the partnership has long realized the impact that our region's uh, housing system has on the economy. And yesterday, we announced a partnership with the Urban Institute and will be with, with many others uh, to launch what we are calling a regional housing framework. Uh, and the framework really is designed to do three things. Uh, to assess the current and future needs of our region's uh, housing system, to um, record and understand projected targets for production and preservation of housing units at all levels, and to identify evidence-based tools and strategies that uh, elected officials and others can use. And we plan to be vocal uh, and rallying a coalition, a movement, as Jack said, to try to, to keep this at the forefront of everyone's attention. Uh, and finally, we have been focused on what many people in the region have, which is the opportunity of Amazon HQ2. Um, we understand that this is a uh, trajectory changer for the region. Uh, as we have all noted many times, we are a slow growth region and we are losing talented workers. And this would be one piece of trying to adjust that trajectory. And we hope allowing us the opportunity to be an example of how you create an inclusive economic powerhouse. From the beginning, the partnership has been involved and supportive of the region's bids. Uh, in round one, we submitted an addendum that went in all 11 bids across the region that touted the assets of the capital region and committed to and shared our commitment to furthering economic growth here and being a partner that outlasts uh, political cycles and will be here for some time. In round two, we have also been supportive, but have been actively working to promote how important unity is to this process. In February, three of our board members, Russ Ramsey, Ted Leonsis, and Sheila Johnson, uh, authored an op-ed in the Washington Post uh, that really lifted up the assets of the region, but talked about how important unity is and the fact that if one of us wins, we all win. To that end, uh, the partnership also conducted some analysis on the economic impacts of what would happen if Amazon came to one part of the region. What does that mean for the other portions of the region? It is quite interesting and happy to um, send that around. We have sent it out, make sure that we can share it with folks here so that you can review it in greater detail. Um, but that information has showed us you know, the incredible impact that we could have here. But while we understand that, we do recognize that it would put strains on the system, that it, will, it would be challenging for the housing system, for transportation, and for other things. Um, but we see this as an opportunity to reimagine our future, to address these challenges in a new way, and to become a national model for what inclusive economic growth really looks like. We're encouraged by uh, what we have seen and the unity that has been exhibited by our region's leaders and hope that the, you know, the benefits will be shared by everybody and the challenges will be addressed uh, evenly, that everybody will pitch in and realizes this is gonna impact the entire region if it comes here. I think most importantly though, 
And we feel like the region has already won, whether this happens or not. People have come together, uh, and after all, this is the place that people come when they want to change the world. Um, this is the place where people understand that plans don't transform anything. People do uh, when they come together and act. All of you are here because you are committed to the success of the region. Uh, you are, want to invest in our future, and we are excited to work with you and the broader community to impact uh, the capital region now and for years to come. So thank you again for having me. I'm happy to take questions. When is the blueprint coming out for the mobility? No, in November, so mid to late November. And we are excited because we're partnering with the Board of Trade and, and RVA Chamber, RVA, and um, GBC to put together an event that will really, it's about a half day event that will bring together the three DOT secretaries and others uh, to really talk in depth, both about the blueprint and about other mobility challenges in the region. Anybody else? People want coffee, don't they? Okay. Jenny, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>